This morning, John was in a wonderful mood. Yesterday evening, he proposed to Betty, and she accepted. So, he walked to work, smiling at his thoughts, pondering the upcoming pleasant responsibilities. In the next few days, the couple planned to visit the registry office and officially submit their application. However, deciding on the wedding date was still a question. They didn't want to celebrate in winter, so they considered postponing it at least until March when spring could provide good weather. It was the end of October now, and the warmth of plus 15 degrees Celsius was unusual for this time of year. John walked from the subway through the city park, squinting his brown eyes at the sun, feeling a slight warmth on his dark head. The Surroundings He was an open person. Ruby and golden leaves were scattered everywhere, and children played with them, making bouquets. It was the school break, and kids frolicked outside, enjoying the warm day. Strokes of green were added by tall firs, and a moss-covered clearing among them. Dogs ran around, playing with their owners, bringing sticks, and colorful balls bounced around while frisbees flew. Thomas loved dogs and admired their lively and joyful energy. Swans adorned the turquoise pond. A dozen majestic birds gracefully swam, and one swan couple basked on the shore, seemingly enjoying the beauty around them and each other. Just like Betty and me, thought John and decided to call his bride. Hello, dear. I want to share my good mood. And John told her about the beauty around him. I hope we will live like swans, preserving love and loyalty to each other. Of course, darling, Betty laughed cheerfully, we have our whole life ahead. Now we'll always be together. I certainly won't start any romantic intrigues in my kindergarten. Well, even if I wanted to, I have no one to do it with. Just kidding, kidding. Betty taught music to children. The 25-year-old girl didn't particularly like her job. She considered it temporary on the way to her dream, performing with a reputable orchestra. She aspired to big concert halls and international tours, not listeners in tights on plastic chairs. But there was a plus in the kindergarten, as Betty mentioned yesterday, promisingly shaking her green eye and tousling her golden curls. But when we have our own kids, I'll bring them to my kindergarten. They'll always be under supervision. John's dreams were more modest. He was two years older than Betty, working as an architect in the department responsible for constructing facilities for the military. The job was interesting and diverse, designing both military barracks and residential quarters for military families. John was satisfied with his workplace and only wanted to grow to become a project leader, entrusted with overseeing some large-scale construction from start to finish. Today, noticing his uplifted mood, colleagues started asking about the reason and then congratulating him. John willingly shared his plans. The popular saying, happiness loves silence, was not at all close to him. He was an open person, preserving some childlike innocence. He believed that how you treat the world, what you give to it, is what comes back to you. And he saw people around him as kind, sincere, without a hidden agenda. He was like that himself. John, can you take a short walk, asked Mark, who was overseeing the project John was working on. We need to deliver some documents to the subway. The ministry requires them for approval in our department. No one from our team is planning to go there anytime soon, but a person from the military hospital called me. Someone is coming from there and will pass by us on the way to the subway. Could you go? You can also go for lunch afterward to avoid going back and forth. Sure, replied John. You know, the weather is so nice today that it would be a shame not to take a stroll. I walk to work through the park. Kids are running around, enjoying life. And for some reason, I had this cheerful feeling as if I'm skipping school. Honestly, I didn't want to leave. So, I'll gladly take another walk. That was settled. John contacted the messenger from the hospital to coordinate the timing. The person had a fairly long way to travel. John estimated that there was about 40 minutes until the meeting and decided to take a longer route to the subway, circling around to pass through the park again. In a dreamy mood, refreshed by the slightly warm sun, he was already heading towards the exit. With a professional gaze, he assessed the park gates, large concrete columns with decorative elements and an amphora, with wrought iron gates between them. The top structure mimicked a terrace adorned with a balustrade. 
although getting inside and strolling around was clearly impossible due to the height. John admired this architectural monument and, at the same time, as an ordinary city dweller, was slightly irritated by the cars visible behind the columns and gates. According to the creator's intention, this should offer a wonderful view of the avenue. But all of it was blocked by cars parked around the park in violation of all rules. It's unsafe. So many children are running around, John thought, and at that moment, he saw his thoughts turning into reality. Out of the corner of his eye, he noticed a girl riding a scooter along a quiet street alongside the park. Suddenly, she darted onto the road. The street had a slope, the girl was going downhill, and she clearly couldn't brake. And ahead was a busy avenue. Moreover, drivers couldn't see a child flying towards them due to the parked cars. An accident was about to happen. There was no time for thinking. In a second, John decided and stepped onto the road to intercept the scooter. He spread his arms, and the girl noticed him. Hope flickered in her bewildered eyes. Somehow, the girl managed to turn the handlebars a bit, and now she was flying straight towards John. At that moment, he felt a strong push from behind. Following that, the scooter collided with him from the front. John managed to realize that he was falling forward and about to crush the child. He pushed the girl to the right onto the sidewalk, and a black veil descended. John came to his senses only in the hospital. A tearful Betty sat beside him. Am I in a movie? John found the strength to smile. Fell, woke up, cast. What happened? I must have been hit by a car. Betty, don't cry, I'm alive, I'll heal before the wedding. Oh, John. Yes, you were hit. Not by a car, but by a bus, the girl explained. They brought you unconscious. The surgery just finished by nightfall. They said you'd come to completely by morning and allowed me to sit with you. Usually, they don't allow visitors after such surgeries, but they made an exception because. Well, you can talk to the doctor yourself, Betty rushed to get ready, I'm going to work now. Take care. The nurse came in. A pleasant middle-aged woman, slender, with a short haircut. Oh, you're awake, that's good, she said cheerfully. All right, I'll give you a painkiller now and set up a drip with glucose to regain strength after the surgery. Then, we'll see what the doctor prescribes. Your treating doctor is David, he also performed the surgery. He'll come for round soon and explain everything. So, let's get the glucose drip going and wait. Roger that, John replied in a military manner and smiled. However, concern flashed in his eyes right away. And what about the girl? Do you know anything? She was flying under the car. Yes, yes, interrupted the nurse, we know about your feet good job not being afraid. The girl is doing fine. We inquired, and we thought you'd ask. She's in the second pediatric room, in the traumatology department. She broke her arm, but the prognosis is favorable. About twenty minutes later, the smell of hospital food wafted in. Breakfast was scheduled for 8 a.m. Patients headed towards the cafeteria past the room. It was a post-operative room, and another man lay in it. He was silent, barely moving, only turning from his back to his side with effort. Apparently, he hadn't fully recovered from anesthesia yet. Breakfast was brought to him and John in the room. It was a meager meal, and it consisted of oatmeal broth. No solid food was allowed after the surgery, although John was craving it terribly. So, broth without salt and sugar, and even without the oatmeal itself, just a slippery mass, seemed quite palatable to him. At least, his growling stomach calmed down. Watching his roommate struggle to move, John also thought about changing positions. He was semi-sitting, semi-lying on his back, propped up with pillows. He thought that he could lower himself and turn to the side to doze while waiting for the doctor. He stretched, took a pillow from behind him, intending to put it on the chair nearby, and then reposition it more comfortably. Suddenly, he realized that he couldn't lift his hips from the bed. Neither turn nor move from the spot. Probably, not everything has returned to normal after the surgery yet, thought the guy. Perhaps that's why they sat me down like this, so that I could eat comfortably. Oh well. 
John put the pillow back behind him, leaned back slightly, and dozed off with a needle in his arm from the fore. John, wake up, please, a calm male voice pulled John out of his nap. He opened his eyes. A short, reddish-haired man in a white coat stood by the bed. I am your attending physician. We need to talk. He pulled up a chair and sat down. This conversation is long and serious. Usually, we have such talks in private. Medical confidentiality. But you can't leave the room, and your neighbor is sleeping, so we'll talk here. John didn't like the serious expression on the doctor's face. He felt the tension, which started to affect him too. John, you were hit by a bus. I suppose you didn't see it. Judging by the nature of the injury, the impact came from behind at the sacral level. There are a lot of nerve endings in that area. Now they are seriously damaged, and... A pause hung in the air. The doctor was clearly choosing his words. The spinal cord is injured. We relieved the compression during emergency surgery as soon as you were brought in. To put it simply, we reduced the pressure on the brain. But we are waiting for the swelling to subside to assess the consequences of the injury. Do you understand what I'm saying? Not entirely. I understood that I can't turn over. I don't feel my legs and the lower part of my body. But I'm not paralyzed, right? Is this a condition after surgery? I'll repeat, it's hard to assess the situation right now. After an injury of this level, there's a shock period. It can last up to a month and a half. So, the picture will become clearer after the swelling subsides. But we'll understand the extent of the spinal cord damage later. In four to six weeks. For now, it's difficult to determine the temporary frames, and I can't give any forecasts. We'll observe. For now, you're staying with us. For a month and a half? John, providing full care for you at home is currently impossible. I live with my fiancé, she will help. You don't understand. It's not just about feeding you and maintaining hygiene. You need to be washed completely, turned, and monitored for sensitivity. It's a full-time job. Do you have someone who can sit with you all day? Of course, you can hire a caregiver around the clock, but do you have that option? I don't know. We had money saved up for a vacation, but we decided to spend it on the wedding. John, having a caregiver is an expensive affair. It's like paying someone's average monthly salary. And you need someone with good qualifications. You can't just ask a neighbor for help. And here in the hospital, you receive qualified care for free. Rest here, don't rush to go home. We have everything under control. Wait, but how do I go to the bathroom? Well, you're not in control of your urine and stool right now. John, you're in diapers. John silently stared at the doctor, and tears started gathering in his eyes. Cry if you need to, don't hold it in, David said sympathetically. Yes, these are bad news. Stay strong. He squeezed John's hand just above the elbow. And stay with us for now, I repeat. We'll do our best to get you back on your feet. There's hope that you'll walk again. The key is to believe in yourself and not be lazy. Follow all the recommendations, do the exercises. We'll fight for you, but for now, rest. Thank you, John managed to say. Thank you for the surgery, at least, and we'll see about the rest. His voice was trembling, and he lowered his eyes. The doctor squeezed his hand again, patting it reassuringly, and left. John called Betty. He asked her to bring his things from home in the evening and come to talk. The rest of the day for him was spent trying to comprehend the scale of the misfortune that had befallen him. There was nothing to distract from gloomy thoughts. The room was mostly silent. The neighbor was recovering from anesthesia, sleeping a lot. Occasionally, he felt nauseous, and the nurses hurried around, cleaning up. But everything quickly settled down, and John was left alone again with his thoughts. What awaited him in the future? What about his job now? And the wedding? All plans went awry. After dinner, consisting once again of the same oatmeal broth, Betty arrived. 
The conversation between the young people was brief and somewhat restrained on emotions. John explained everything the doctor had said. Betty seemed to take it calmly. She sighed, saying, it's a pity, of course, that plans are falling apart, but health is more important, of course. John, we'll figure out vacations and weddings later, after you're discharged and recover. We've lived together for a year without getting married. We'll continue to live without any paperwork, she smiled. Take care, get well, and we'll see what happens next. These words somewhat reassured John and gave him strength to fight for recovery. I will walk, he thought resolutely and decided to put in all efforts for that. Weeks passed. Hospital life followed its measured routine. The day had a schedule, wake up, temperature check, IVs, medications, hygiene procedures, breakfast, doctor's rounds, exercises for arms and upper body, lunch, nap, dinner, visiting hours for relatives, more pills and IVs, and sleep. The routine was becoming tedious, but John, although an architect, had a military background and strictly followed all instructions, adhering to the prescribed medications and not slacking on exercises. Occasionally, Betty would visit. Not often. A couple of times a week. She complained that it took her a long time to get to the hospital after work and that it was out of her way to their rented apartment. John nodded understandingly, but secretly he was a bit surprised. After all, teaching music to children wasn't the most exhausting job. And the kindergarten classes were in the first half of the day. There seemed to be time to visit the hospital. But he didn't press her. He understood that it was hard for her too. All plans were postponed indefinitely, and most of the rent for the apartment fell on her, as John was on sick leave. And the payments were minimal, 60%, as his work experience was less than five years. Three weeks later, another visitor came to see him. It was Sandra, the little girl he had saved. Thank you, Uncle John, for catching me, the eight-year-old girl said solemnly. Only you broke your arm because of me, John replied. You know, the broken arm is the least of the evils that could have happened, Kevin, the girl's father, said excitedly. I'm the driver myself. I checked the accident site. She was flying straight onto the avenue under the cars, and then this bus came out of nowhere. They shouldn't even be driving there. It turns out they brought rural schoolchildren to the circus during the holidays. And before that, they decided to stop by the park so that they could calm down and sit quietly during the show. The driver from the village doesn't know the roads here. So, he was just trying to get closer to the park. He saw that everyone was parking there despite the signs and decided to break the rules. A good guy, apologized a lot. He was glad he didn't cause more trouble. At this point, the man noticed John's reaction. Well, at least everyone is alive, John said. We are very grateful to you, Sandra's mom, Karen, added. We didn't even notice that scooter. It's a quiet street. We were walking from the park, relaxed and enjoying ourselves, and in a fraction of a second, Sandra rolled downhill. We just didn't have time to react. It's fortunate that you were closer. Then the woman hesitated. I mean, it's fortunate for us, and for you, I'm sorry, she finally blurted out. It's okay, John said. Apparently, I was in the right place at the right time. I shouldn't have been there at all. Let me tell you why. And he explained how his boss had asked him for a favor, and that's why he ended up in the park during working hours. Thank you, I can't find enough words to express our gratitude, Kevin said. You can count on us for everything. We will help you with treatment, rehabilitation, with everything you need. Don't refuse. We can afford it. Moreover, our daughter's life is priceless. Call us as soon as something becomes clear about further procedures for recovery. I'll organize everything. John was discharged almost two months later. The hospital stay had been prolonged due to the severity of the injury. There was still a long process of outpatient treatment and a complex rehabilitation program ahead. He was sent home for a few days. Kevin, the father of the saved girl, drove him home. John was in a wheelchair, which he had already gotten used to in the hospital. He had learned to transfer himself to the bed and the exercise equipment. 
Now Kevin helped him get into the car. John proudly drove into his own house. Now he appreciated the ramp on the steps to the entrance, which he had never paid attention to before. He used to think it was a device only for mothers with strollers and pensioners with their always fully loaded shopping carts. The ramp turned out to be quite convenient for a wheelchair user, not too steep. Besides, the elevator in their building was on the ground floor, without any steps leading to it, as sometimes happens. So, the journey home turned out to be quite manageable for the young man. Betty, by the way, diligently avoided the word disabled. And in general, she pretended that nothing had changed. Now she was busy with household chores in the kitchen. She had prepared a lot of food, and even the windows were steamed up from the heat. John was greeted by the aromatic scent of freshly baked buns and laurel leaves. The familiar smells of a cozy home with a calm and well-established life. Kevin reminded John once again that he was ready to help him with anything and said, Goodbye. Rest, they had already switched to informal AU. And by the end of the week, we'll go to the rehabilitation center. Decide which one you prefer. There are many good ones around here, but check for all the necessary procedures. We'll go, I think, on Sunday, so you have the evening to settle in. And starting from Monday, you can begin the course of procedures. Okay. Thank you. Send my regards to Sandra and Karen, John said with a smile as they bid farewell. What could he do? He had already gotten used to being taken care of. It was initially challenging to accept help, but he couldn't survive without it. John approached the table in the dining room where Betty was bringing in ready-made dishes one after another, and the group sat down to eat. You're amazing, John casually remarked. Thank you for the delicious food and for taking care of everything. Everything will work out, I hope. I'll call work tomorrow. I don't know when I'll be able to return, but I need to let them know. John, we need to talk, the girl suddenly said very seriously. I probably won't be able to handle all of this. What are you talking about? John, understand me correctly. A couple of months ago, we had a completely different life. We were planning a wedding. Well, yes. I understand that you were ready for a life of sorrow and joy. I was ready, but not for the same sorrow that my husband will be disabled, the girl finally said, literally spitting out the word with resentment. That's an interesting gradation of grief for you, John said thoughtfully, looking at Betty. Well, interesting or not. I'm not ready to live with a disabled person, to put it bluntly. But honestly, I don't think we should continue living together and making plans. It was clear that Betty was extremely determined. Well, shall I start packing my bags right away? John asked with an oddly calm demeanor. Why should I pack? I pay for the apartment. I'll stay here. Your pennies on sick leave barely cover medicine. And you don't even know how long you'll be in the sanatorium for rehabilitation. So, I'm staying here. No need for extra hassle on my part, Betty shrugged. Well, yes, this movement is beneficial to me now. After all, if I start moving my body, it's happiness, isn't it? John retorted. Okay, I understand your position. I suspected that we might have difficulties in our personal life, that everything needed to be reconsidered. To practically adapt to a new way of life. But I didn't expect this from you. A sharp turn, you know, 180 degrees from love to rejection. Let's stop this conversation, Betty interrupted. Think whatever you want about me. But this is my final decision. I'm not even 30, and I don't plan to bury myself. You can live here until you leave for the sanatorium, and after that, go wherever you want. I hope I will go, in the literal sense, John retorted. Make the bed for me here on the couch. Please. Rest in the bedroom without me, and away from me. About ten minutes later, he lay down, turned his face to the wall, and pretended to be asleep. When Betty turned off the light and left, John felt tears rolling down his face. Trouble doesn't come alone. And the next day, John found out that not only his fiancé had left, but he also no longer had a job. His boss, Mark, mumbled something about staff optimization, about the company cutting costs, but John understood everything perfectly. 
Okay, Mark, maintaining a disabled person is expensive. It's unclear when I'll be back to work, and no one wants to pay for sick leave. Prepare the documents for dismissal at my own request. I'll pick up my employment record in a few days, John said, not listening to any justifications, and hung up. Nevertheless, it was Mark who took care to place John in a good sanatorium. Through his connections, he arranged for the recently dismissed employee to be accepted, albeit for a fee, with special attention paid at the military health resort. Herbs, leeches, and there you go, back on your feet, Mark jovially exclaimed, sharing the good news with John. John laughed too, but with a heavy heart. He was perplexed. A good sanatorium was excellent news, but all his time would be consumed by procedures. When would he have the chance to plan for life after rehabilitation? After all, he had nowhere to go after the rehabilitation. His fiancée had rejected their home, and it felt awkward to squeeze into his parents' tiny two-bedroom apartment. In the end, he decided that although he wasn't Scarlett O'Hara, he would think about it tomorrow. Or more precisely, in a whole month, the duration of his rehabilitation. In the sanatorium, John was determined to get back on his feet and pushed himself to the limit. He had almost no free moments, leaving no time for pessimism. He diligently participated in various treatments, trying every method and procedure. He moved from mud baths to regular ones, where they performed underwater spinal traction. His muscles were stimulated with electric shocks, his nerves with lasers, and his joints with magnets. Special patches were applied to his body in a procedure called taping. During therapeutic exercises, his body was bent and straightened to the point of tears. And yes, he also got acquainted with leeches. In comparison, massage felt like a heavenly gift. It was the most enjoyable aspect of all his treatments. The massage therapist, Barbara, a light-haired, gray-eyed, plump woman, made the experience even more pleasant. Sometimes, normal masculine thoughts crossed John's mind, considering it would have been better if he could touch her, this attractive masseuse. But he dismissed these desires, believing that nobody needed a disabled man. In the evening, he went out to get some fresh air and admire the landscapes. The surroundings were picturesque. The sanatorium had been known as a health resort since the 1920s. It was situated on the grounds of a noble estate. The former manor house, with its pointed towers, toothed ridges, and pointed windows, resembled a medieval castle. Some other buildings from that era, now auxiliary facilities for the health resort, were also preserved. All of this was surrounded by an ancient park with ponds and fountains. In December, everything was covered with snow, adding beauty and mystery to the landscape. John approached an elegant gazebo adorned with a statue of Apollo Belvedere. It was built in the 18th century, a cheerful female voice sounded nearby. John quickly turned around. Sandra's dad had provided him with the best and very expensive wheelchair that allowed him to make maneuvers efficiently. This German marvel could even travel across rough terrain, accelerating to 15 km per hour, the seat, footrests, armrest, everything was automatically adjustable with electronics. It was controlled by a joystick. There was even a USB port and a power bank for a mobile phone. All these features turned the structure into almost a fully-fledged mini-car. The woman behind John turned out to be in her early 60s, dark-haired, wearing dark sunglasses, and also in a wheelchair. Linda, she introduced herself. I've been here not for the first time. It's an excellent sanatorium. Good specialists and a wonderful place with history, she continued, and then said, let's go. John followed her. A few minutes later, they stopped near a large bridge in a gothic style made of red brick with towering white columns. Looking at it, one might feel like being in a medieval knight's castle, not in a suburban sanatorium. And here they filmed the woman who sings, the new acquaintance said with a touch of a tour guide. But I hope you've heard about her. Although your generation is young, hopefully you still have an interest in different songs. Of course, I've heard, John smiled. I've heard a lot and about many things. Well, I think that personal life is her business. Purely personal. Excuse me for tautology. But I can't forgive her for ruining her voice, apparently smoking. And how it sounded before. 
her songs used to open the soul, both in words and in music. She sang one of those piercing compositions right here on this bridge, it's called Sonnet 90. Imagine the power of this union of geniuses. Ah. Talented people. Talented times, the woman sighed. I didn't know that, John said. I've heard about the movie, of course, but I don't remember the song. When you have the chance, give it a listen. There are some very good lines. Please don't leave a person in distress and don't become the last drop of sorrow for them, Linda said, glancing at John, adding, I think it's relevant for you. Indeed, John said. My fiancé just left me. She didn't like the prognosis for my health and our joint prospects. Well, let this be the last drop of sorrow for you. After all, you've already had your fair share, I believe. Okay, let's continue the tour. Or rather, the ride, Linda joked good-naturedly, making it clear that John shouldn't take offense at her teasing about their shared situation. They passed by the abandoned parts of the estate, decaying carriage houses, a stable, and the manager's house. Stray dogs inhabited the ruins. The sanatorium management was against homeless animals, but the vacationers secretly fed them. So, the dogs hid but didn't leave the territory. Now a couple of four-legged friends ran out, wagging their tails, upon seeing Linda. She took a little patty from her jacket pocket, broke it in half, and tossed it to them. Divide it like brothers, she joked. Okay, let's go back. My husband should drop by today. It doesn't happen often, but he tries once a week. It's our tradition. I've accustomed him, he shouldn't show up without flowers. I need to rinse the vase in advance. We'll chat some more, there's still time. I'm here for a month. Arrivederci, she waved. Goodbye. And the spirited retiree rolled away into the twilight along a path trampled through the snowdrifts. Communicating with Linda in the following week became the best inspiration and psychoanalysis for John. In the sanatorium, he attended psychotherapy sessions, but Linda, not using abstract examples but sharing her own experience, inspired him and taught him to love life anew. She had been in a wheelchair for about two decades due to a car accident, just like John. She was tired after work, driving home, and ended up in a head on collision with a truck. Her husband left almost immediately. Her daughter, who was 14 at the time, helped her. They coped. When Linda regained her strength, she decided to focus on her personal life. She needed household assistance because her daughter was growing up. Soon, the time would come when she would want to start her own family. Besides, Linda didn't want to give up on herself. At that time, she was just over 40. You know, Linda told John, I'm not even mad at my ex-husband. He married a healthy woman, and here I turned out to be sick. Not what he expected. But when people see you in a wheelchair from the start, they immediately understand that you're a person with certain limitations. And if they are ready to have a relationship with you, it's with a full understanding of the situation and responsibility. Do you understand what I mean? How I met my current husband. At a charity concert where disabled people performed. Donald brought my sister there, she's also in a wheelchair and sings beautifully. We got to know each other talking about it. He saw through his sister that difficulties shouldn't be feared. Yes, they arise, but mostly related to mobility. But otherwise, we're ordinary people with a standard way of life. So, don't get discouraged. You'll find a girl who'll accept you as you are. Of course, there are nuances, a urine bag doesn't exactly enhance a man's appearance, but everything can be calculated and removed when necessary. Do you get what I mean? Regarding physiology of a different kind, believe me, understanding and figuring it out are possible, if there's a desire in every sense, Linda chuckled. I haven't thought about that yet, blushed John. You will when things get better. It's normal and natural at any age. And you're a young guy, it's as if God ordered it. And you'll have kids. The situation is the same there. If children see you in a wheelchair from the start, it's their life norm. But if you were healthy and suddenly became helpless and yes, that would shock them. My daughter even felt embarrassed when I came to her school. Attention was heightened, everyone dropped everything to help me, 
even though I didn't ask for it. Doors were opened, they escorted me, helped me navigate the class. But people didn't mind showing care, and at first, they looked at me with pity, almost crying. But then they realized I was just as active a person as they were. I was with them everywhere, on hikes, in theaters, and in the forest. I participated in all the activities of the parent committee. So everyone just got used to having a person in a wheelchair around them, and they even stopped noticing it. For them, it became ordinary, while for me, it became a rule, to not sit at home and cry over my fate, but to live actively, Linda shared. Yes, like they say about people with limited abilities. And it turns out you have a person with unlimited possibilities, John said. And you will too. Just wait and see, Linda encouraged him. John didn't reveal his little secret about his growing affection for Nurse Barbara just yet. He was still somewhat shy about his feelings. His focus was on his recovery, he needed to figure out how to stand on his own two feet, not get involved in romantic affairs. However, Barbara, as it seemed to him, singled him out a bit among the other patients. During massages, she wasn't silent like with others, she talked a lot. She shared about herself and inquired about John's plans. At one point, she touched on an important topic for John. You know, your fate wasn't like Betty's, the girl said thoughtfully, massaging John's thigh. You see, I hear a lot of stories here. When such a trauma happens to a person, Barbara carefully chose her words, clearly not wanting to hurt John's feelings, when the Lord sends such a trial, men usually leave their ailing partners. It doesn't matter if they are in the early stages of a relationship or have been married for a long time. Women, in such situations, rarely abandon their partners. Probably because they perceive them more as relatives than just objects of pleasure, fulfilling all their desires. Not to offend you, but that's how it often goes. But in your case, you see, the woman quickly and easily decided that she was no longer on the same path with you. So, she probably didn't feel any special love. She just flowed with the current, getting married like everyone else, having children as everyone does. Well, stereotypically. Without thinking that life binds you forever with a person and that means sharing all the hardships equally. I found it strange too, John admitted. Too fast. I had just been discharged from the hospital. I came home, and I wanted some comfort, tranquility, at least a little bit of my old life. And she surprised me like that. She didn't even try to live with me a little. Maybe everything wouldn't have been so bad. As Linda says, he smiled, remembering his new acquaintance, you know Linda, right? Such an inspiring woman, so optimistic. Of course, I know. Her fate is heavy. How she finds the strength to live, I don't know, Barbara said. Yeah, she told me about her injury and how her husband left afterward. Well, she started over. She's strong. Wait. That's not all that fate gave her. Her daughter died. After she became disabled, only her daughter stayed with her. A teenager, helping her mother in any way she could. She was always busy with household chores, didn't have much time for walks. And then fate, you know, she managed to break free for her friend's birthday, returning in the dark with headphones on, crossing a railway crossing. Well, that's it. She didn't hear or see the train. Probably, she was too tired, didn't notice the red signal at the crossing. Oh my god, poor Linda. Just don't say I told you all this. She doesn't open up to everyone, she doesn't like to cry. She trusted me with this. Only God knows what's in her soul. And why do you keep mentioning God all the time? Are you religious? Yes, Barbara said with calm dignity. I know it's not fashionable, but I believe that everything is controlled by the Lord, not by humans. Yes, His ways are inscrutable, but everything is for our good, and everything that He sends is within our capabilities. Okay, I won't argue with you. Thanks for the massage. I'll roll on, John steered the conversation. He pondered this conversation the next day. About people's destinies, Barbara's archaic faith, judge not, and ye shall not be judged, he remembered, and he tried to shift his attention. He passed by picturesque ruins where homeless dogs frolicked. One of them was gnawing on something in the bushes, 
probably arranging a stick for a game. A couple more dogs frolicked, playfully attacking each other, lightly biting each other's paws and ears. Now, that's a dog's happiness of running and playing carefree, John thought. Their legs are already working well, and I'll strengthen mine with a bit of food. He began to reach for the bag with the saved pieces of cutlets and bread, bones collected after dinner and breakfast. However, the dog suddenly tensed, looking in a certain direction, tails tucked, and scattered. John awkwardly turned to see what had frightened them and saw a van from the Stray Animal Control Service. Two staggering men, clearly intoxicated, walked away from it, holding animal catchers with loops on sticks. Guys, don't touch the dogs, John addressed them. They're not bothering anyone. They bother our bosses. That's who called us. We're just doing our job, one of the men mechanically replied, clearly not hearing such defenses for the first time. The catchers just walked past John as if he were an empty space and disappeared into the bushes. If only I were normal, John thought bitterly. A pathetic invalid, unable to protect anyone. In any case. Then he decisively rushed toward the van, as fast as his miracle wheelchair allowed. He approached from behind and tried to open the door, behind which someone was whimpering quietly, sadly, and very hopelessly. There was a metal latch at the bottom, which he moved aside immediately. But in the middle of the door, there was another one. John raised the seat to the maximum, but he couldn't reach. Precious seconds passed, and the catchers could return any moment. John looked around. If only there was some stick lying around. But no. The sanatorium's territory was clean to sterility. The trunk, John suddenly realized. His miracle wheelchair had a detachable trunk at the back. John reached behind, quickly removed the structure, and with its end reached the latch. A couple of movements, and it opened. Looking inside, John was stunned. On the iron floor lay a single dog, barely alive. The muzzle was right by the door, eyes half-closed and indifferent. She was barely breathing and whimpered quietly. These sounds were even more like a human moan. The dog lay on her left side, and her right front paw was strangely stretched out on top of her body. The leg was very swollen, with torn wounds, dirty, with festering and a very bad smell. The dog herself wasn't very clean. Despite her gray fur, which somewhat camouflaged the dirt, dried clumps of soil and oily streaks were still visible. Overall, the animal looked somehow strange. It was very large, the size of a shepherd, but darker and with long legs. The muzzle was broad with a stretched appearance, narrowing with powerful jaws. Large fangs were visible from the slightly open mouth. Her eyes were an unusual amber color for a dog. In general, the dog resembled more of a wolf. But a wild animal wouldn't end up in a catch van, John thought. A wolf would either escape or be shot. Why catch and euthanize it? His thoughts were interrupted by the men who returned to the car. On their stick with a loop, they dragged a small red dog from the strays that roamed the territory. John knew her. The poor thing just couldn't run away like the others due to her age. She was very old, and when John brought food to the dogs, she patiently waited on the sidelines until the others had eaten. Apparently realizing that she could no longer compete for food. John usually fed her separately. First, he distributed to the pack, and then he called the old lady to himself and fed her right from his hand. Now the dog didn't resist her tormentors. With submission in her eyes, limping, she tried to keep up with them with her old rheumatic paws so that at least they wouldn't drag her along the ground. Hey, what have you done? One of the men noticed the open van door. Disabled, damn it, have you lost it or what? Get out of here, he said roughly to John, shoving him aside, to stuff their four-legged victim into the trunk. The dog looked at the lying dog with some apprehension. Apparently, she also seemed like a wolf, but the poor thing still lay there, not reacting to anyone. Guys, calm down, wait a bit, don't argue, John said as peacefully as he could, although, in reality, he wanted to beat them if it were possible. He felt sorry for the dogs, whose only fault was being unwanted and striving for humans, just trying to survive. We don't have time to chat with you. We've been driving from point to point all day, 
grunted the second man, who looked less disheveled and more good-natured than the first. They assigned us a full schedule today. They called us here almost at the end, and there's a few more hours of work. We're already running late to cover the entire territory. So, whoever we catch, we catch, he glanced at the old lady huddled in the corner and then at the lifeless large dog, look at this monster, it took us quite an effort. Barely got her packed. Almost dead, seemingly, but feisty. Resisted until we hit her on the head. And where did you find her? She looks like a wild animal, John tried to keep the conversation going. The talkative guy lit a cigarette and sat on a bench next to John. We were called to a cottage nearby today. It wasn't just a small house, but a huge mansion with an enormous territory, like an estate from the old times. Yeah, something like this local estate of yours. And this bitch somehow started hanging around there. There's a homeowner's German shepherd, and she used to go to him. All bitches are submissive to love, it seems, even such scary ones, he chuckled at his joke. Well, everything was fine with the dog. Quiet. No questions from the cottage owner at first. But when people found her on the territory, she started attacking them, snarling. Well, obviously wild. And the owners had little kids. They endured, thought she'd fall in love with her suitor and disappear. No, she kept going. In the end, they set a trap. Well, that bitch fell into it. Still, she didn't give up, struggled, growled until they hit her on the head. Local workers were afraid to approach her. Thought she'd die on her own. No, it's been three days, she's tough, clacking her teeth. Well, that's when they called us. She was almost done for, so it was an easy job. Into the loop and into the van. And they paid us well, over our salary, didn't she? So, this mutt won't bother anyone anymore. And we'll drink to her soul's repose tonight, he grinned. Do you want to earn more? John seized the moment, trying to save the unfortunate animal. Sell her to me. What? Are you kidding, pal? Why do you need such a dog? Forgive me, but you're disabled. Even if she somehow recovers, you won't handle her. The gloomy man spoke up. She'll die anyway. What's the point? This creature's tortured enough. Damn Frankenstein, he spat. I even think it's not a dog but a mix with a wolf, a wolf dog. The military bred them together, wanting to get the best qualities from both sides. Whether they succeeded or not, hell knows, but I've seen such bitches nearby. There's a military unit around here, maybe she escaped from there. About ten of them live there. The soldiers showed them to us and told us about this strange breed. And we used to catch cats for them. The ones that these Frankensteins didn't tear apart in time. You could say we saved poor kitty souls from a painful death. John decided not to comment on this tirade, not understanding how one death could be better than another. Whether from an injection or in a dog's jaws, death is death. Guys, does she mean anything to you? The guy asked, trying to save the unfortunate animal. I'll give you money, and what I do with her is my business. Will five hundred be enough? Five hundred for this mutt, scoffed the angry man. Fine, it's your business, buddy. Give us the money, and take your grey beauty. Wait a few minutes. They'll bring me the money now, I didn't take any with me. I went for a walk. All right, grumbled the man. Just hurry up. We need to go home, and he climbed into the cabin. John called Barbara. Barbara, are you still at work? Don't ask anything, please. Come to the entrance gates right now and bring five hundred and some alcohol. John, what happened, the girl asked anxiously. Are you in trouble? Where are you? Barbara, I'm at the gate, I told you. I'll explain everything to you later. Come, please. It's urgent. A few minutes later, a breathless Barbara arrived. First, she handed the money and a plastic bottle from under lemonade, which contained alcohol. Then she looked around, completely bewildered by the scene and its characters, just stood slightly aside, and remained silent. Guys, take the money and have a drink, to warm up. 
You've been working hard all day, freezing, John tried to speak in their manner. The guys were pleased, took a swig straight from the bottle. All right, I'm at the wheel, wet my throat, won't drink anymore, said the gloomy guy, Thomas, after warming up a bit with a drink. He turned to the good-natured one, let's go. Have another sip if you want, and let's hit the road. You can finish on the way, and he headed towards the cabin. Wait a moment, John called after them, guys, can't you see the condition I'm in? Get the dog, please. Oh, right, no problem. Both catchers went to the truck, got the dog, which hung lifelessly in their arms, and laid it next to a snowdrift on the road. Guys, the girl won't help me. Please, just drag her to that bench. John pointed to a bench closer to the sanatorium building. She'll freeze on the snow, and I can't lift her. Put her on the bench, and we'll figure it out from there. Oh, you've got us into trouble, dude. The good-natured guy took another sip of alcohol and took a handful of snow. All right, Andrin, let's go. We've got her, screw it, he mumbled, somewhat drunk. The men lifted the dog by the paws and dragged her to the bench. Her body trailed along the path, but John kept silent. That's it, we're settled. Let's go, said the angry one and went to close the truck, leaving the doors open. Damn it, he suddenly shouted, you turned left, and where's that redhead bitch? John hid his smile. His plan worked. While the guys were talking to him, he saw that the old dog was looking at him, clearly contemplating how to escape from the cold metal truck. Her years of experience told her that nothing good could be expected from those guys, and John was on her side. While the catchers were drinking, the old lady began to approach the snowdrift. Jumping far to the ground was difficult. She was low to the ground, like a corgi, so she figured that it would be closer and softer to fly into the snow. John kept an eye on her with his peripheral vision, afraid to attract attention to her. He understood that the red dog would be noticed on the white snow, and she wouldn't get far on her sore legs. And then a saving idea came to him, to ask them to move the big dog. The slightly tipsy guys, apparently, completely forgot that there was someone else in the truck and left the doors open when they dragged the wolf dog away. Damn it, the angry one yelled, we've worked all day, and what? We won't bring anyone. They'll say we messed around somewhere, they'll fine us again. Guys, I'm sorry, John said in a conciliatory tone, I hope the money I gave will cover the fine, and there will be some left. Barbara, go get some more spirits for the road. We don't need your booze, the good-natured one got annoyed, let's go, I want to eat and sleep. All right, goodbye, give my gigantic dog greetings, and the old redhead too, if you see her. She got lucky today. The sky will smoke some more. The catchers got in the car, slammed the doors angrily, and drove away. John, what was that? Barbara finally spoke up. Wanted to save the dog, ended up saving too, John dryly remarked, I don't know why I did it. Just couldn't watch as living beings were taken to their death. I wonder where the redhead ran off to. I saw her plop into a snowdrift. She quickly got up and limped in the direction of the gazebo by the pond. I'll go check on her. She couldn't have gone far, and the girl went in that direction. Meanwhile, John stroked the dog lying on the bench. She tried to lift her head, realizing that something had changed, but weakly let it drop back down. The guy noticed that her fur felt unusual, very stiff. Underneath, he could feel a dense, thick undercoat. It was getting dark, and John turned on the headlights of his wheelchair to illuminate the way, although he didn't yet know where to take this giant, lying dog. Barbara returned, not alone. The same old redhead was following her. The dog limped even more than usual. Apparently, she injured her paw upon landing. What are we going to do with two on a winter night? The girl asked with a chuckle. First, we need to figure out where to hide them. A night outside could be their last. One can't move, the other, although mobile, struggles. So, with me, it's three invalids. Three invalids and Barbara. Like, three tank men, but the other way around, I guess. And then John unexpectedly burst into laughter. Not hysterically, although it wouldn't be surprising in this situation, but a genuinely hearty, loud laughter. 
Okay, Barbara, sorry. Some black humor came out. Tell me, what should I do? You know the surroundings better, where can we hide the dogs? You know, there's this place. They store sports equipment there, rackets, tennis balls, rollerblades, bikes. Well, everything that's rented out in season. Until spring, hardly anyone will go into this utility room. It's in the basement of the administrative building. There's heating there. So, we can try taking the dogs there, and the room is behind the building, there's almost immediately a fence and a forest. No one goes there. So even if they bark, hardly anyone will hear. Or they'll think that homeless animals are breaking in from the forest. Well, let's try. But how do we get the big dog there? Good question. I think we should try to drag her onto your wheelchair. We need to put something under her, or better yet, wrap her in something. It'll be more comfortable to drag that way. Just what to use, John said thoughtfully, listen, maybe take a blanket from the room. It should be enough to wrap, tie, and drag her. Let me go get it, Barbara said, then I'll take it to the laundry. I'll wash it quickly. Half an hour later, they finally reached the utility room. Barbara asked the administrator for the key, inventing a story about wanting to take home table tennis rackets since her hands hurt after a massage and she wanted to warm up with a game. The administrator, a former military man in his fifties, clearly doubted this story, but he trusted Barbara and gave her the key. The utility room turned out to be quite spacious. Sports equipment and gear lay on shelves along the walls. Thick basement heating pipes ran in the far end. There, Barbara and John placed the large dog. Feeling the warmth after spending several days in a trap on the street, she seemed to thaw and began to move. She stretched a little, shifted towards the pipe, and lay down more comfortably. Barbara, on the way, managed to stop by the dining room, where they washed dishes after dinner, and asked for leftovers of porridge and chicken cutlets for her home dog, pretending that she didn't have time to buy anything and was delayed at work. The good-natured dishwashers loaded her with waste into a plastic bag. Now, when Barbara took it out, and the aromas spread through the utility room, the lying dog moved even more. She started pawing, trying to stand up. She couldn't and made a strange sound, which, judging by the intonation, should have been a pleading whimper but sounded more like a guttural growl. The dog stopped her futile attempts to get up and looked at the bag expectantly. The old lady also perked up. Until now, she had quietly followed her saviors, realizing that they weren't driving her away. Now, she timidly approached Barbara and the bag, trying not to step in front of the large dog's muzzle, yielding her priority. The girl laid out the food for them on pieces of cardboard found in the utility room. She didn't think about bowls or anything like that. The large dog lifted herself, leaning on her undamaged left front paw, and quickly ate what was given to her in a matter of seconds, not even chewing much but eagerly swallowing the still warm food. The old lady also ate with appetite, but more slowly, nibbling her share and dragging the bone under a shelf with rollerblades for a more comfortable and thoughtful chew. Chicken bones are not recommended for dogs, of course, John noted, but I guess we don't have much choice for them or us. Thank you, Barbara, for the doggy dinner. I wouldn't mind some myself. God, he suddenly realized, it's already around nine. How are you going to get home from here? The last buses for the night left around eight. Yes, I didn't count on the bus anymore when all this started, Barbara said. The head of the barotherapy department could have given me a lift to the metro, but I was late even for that. She shrugged pleasantly and smiled. Is he the tall one with a mustache and a trendy haircut? John clarified with a hint of jealousy, though he didn't consciously realize it, but Barbara caught the vibes and smiled a little slyly. Yes, the girl said, a very nice man. He has three kids and a little dog too. A good family man. He shows me all the family photos. Of course, she wanted to tease John a little, but due to his health condition, she thought it would be inappropriate. The professional nurse prevailed in her over the coquette. The man came here to get treatment, not to get nervous, because of me, she thought. I see, John said more calmly, so, where will you stay overnight? In the ward, Barbara replied, there are many available now. It's not the vacation season, and there are fewer people in winter for specific treatments. 
There will be a rush for New Year's celebration in about a week. But for now, I have a place to crash. Okay, let's go from here then. These two are obviously planning to sleep already, John waved his hand towards the dogs, I hope the night will pass quietly. The guys closed the utility room, made their way to the sleeping quarters, and went to their respective rooms. In the morning, after breakfast and the minimum necessary procedures, John headed towards the utility room. He decided to check early to see if the dogs had caused any trouble. For this reason, he skipped the session of the therapeutic pearl bath. John had been making fun of this procedure a bit, despite doctors insisting that such baths were good not only for the skin and calming the nerves but also for relieving muscle pain. That's why they recommended it to him. But John decided that one missed session wouldn't hurt, and at 11 in the morning, he sneaked as much as he could on his wheelchair from the therapeutic building to the administrative one. He tried to remain unnoticed because at this time, patients were supposed to diligently undergo treatment at the sanatorium, not navigate snowdrifts on its territory. Approaching the utility room, he heard a quiet but persistent howl with a single mournful note, like that of wolves. When John opened the door, the large, strange-looking dog sat right behind it, leaning against the jam to avoid putting weight on her injured paw. The howling ceased immediately. From under the shelf with rollerblades, the old redhead looked out with a rather calm expression. It was evident that she was a bit wary of her companion but understood that she needed to behave modestly. Nevertheless, she felt quite comfortable in her company. And a bit further, near the wall, two brown piles lay, one larger and one smaller. Oh, I'm a fool, John scolded himself, slapping his forehead, this is what happens when you haven't had dogs around for a long time. You need to walk them, and I didn't even think about it. He called Barbara. Barbara, I apologize for bothering you again. Firstly, how are you after our night adventures? I'm fine, the girl cheerfully replied, I went to bed almost right away, tired, and slept well. I'm already starting work. Patients aren't scheduled for the morning, and I have larger breaks between them later. So, there's time to talk. That's wonderful, John rejoiced, just forgive me. I don't want to talk but ask you for help. It's becoming a tradition for me now. Because, secondly, the dogs here caused some trouble. Well, we didn't think this through, Barbara sighed, let me run out for half an hour now, and we'll try to walk them. They would remember this scene for many years to come. Barbara in a winter coat thrown over her robe, John in his wheelchair, wearing tracksuits and a puffer jacket, panting, sweating on the back corners of the sanatorium, and two dogs, sitting in parallel near the fence, facing each other with their muzzles. They clearly endured for a long time, inexplicably considering it inappropriate to defile the utility room with puddles. After finishing their business, the dogs started walking along the fence, stretching their legs. Of course, the girls didn't have leashes or collars. Hey, wait, John tried to call the dogs so they wouldn't go around the corner of the building, where they could be noticed, Barbara, listen, we need to call them somehow. Well, I mean, give them names. Stay, doesn't seem to work well. I agree. And what should we call them, Wolfus and Orange? One is red, and the other looks very much like a wild animal. Well, let's choose normal names. But now we need to get them back somehow. With these words, John slightly moved on his wheelchair toward the door of the utility room, and the dogs instantly detached from their important business, eagerly approaching, intending to return to the warmth. Well, wonderful, John said, this time the problem is solved. Barbara decided to go and ask for the dogs' breakfast leftovers. Meanwhile, John went inside and tried to communicate with the pets. So, Wolfus, how should I name you? What famous wolves do we know? The famous one that nursed Romulus and Remus is nameless. Although they put up a monument to her, they didn't come up with a name. The capital Wolf, that's it. Not very suitable to call you that, though, John pondered aloud. The nameless wolf dog listened very attentively, stretching her large, erect ears tensely. Barbara returned with food, and the dogs got busy with their favorite activity, eating warm porridge, this time with pieces of fish cutlets. John told the girl about his musings on the name. Well, let's continue the logical chain, Barbara suggested, what is associated with Italy for you? What comes to your mind first? 
pizza, pasta, Colosseum, John began to list. Barbara laughed. Maybe, let's consider female names instead. She sat down next to John on a tilted stool and watched the dogs chew. Simona, the beauty queen, Barbara laughed, just kidding. Let's think of Italian actresses, Sofia, Gina, Monica, Arnella, Isabella, Claudia. Stop, how about Gina, said John, a good name, short and sonorous, and it suits her elongated muzzle, I think. Let's go, agreed Barbara, and for the second one, so as not to struggle, I suggest calling her Dina and Zina, echoing each other. What do you think? Agreed, said John. He turned, looked at the smiling Barbara, and suddenly reached out to her, stroked her face, pulled her towards him, and kissed her. It seemed like the girl had been waiting for this for a long time, as eagerly as she responded to the kiss. After that, they were silent for half a minute, coming to their senses from the surge of emotions. Barbara, I understand everything, John whispered, looking into her eyes with a glow of tenderness, but there's something I can't give you. Let's focus on what you can give and have already given, the girl interrupted him, I feel completely comfortable with you, not tense, I would say. I'm not trying to be better than I am, pretending to be something I'm not. I enjoy talking to you about everything. I like that you are kind. And forgive me, even in your current condition, you care not only about yourself but also about the dogs. So, let's not talk about the future now. Let's enjoy the present. Although, we can't enjoy it anymore. I have a patient. I'll run. Or we can go to the building together, but right now. John looked at the dogs, which were already dozing quietly closer to the hot pipes, and followed Barbara. The next day went similarly. Barbara's work, John's treatment, joint care for the dogs. The guys didn't like how Gina's paw looked. Barbara treated the wounds from the trap with peroxide and applied an ointment that reduced inflammation. Surprisingly, the dog allowed herself to be bandaged calmly. In her eyes, there was something like gratitude, understanding, and acceptance of the situation. She let them do strange things to her, things that her mind couldn't comprehend, realizing that these manipulations made her feel better. The wounds were healing, the paw became less swollen, but the swelling didn't completely subside, and Gina noticeably limped when walking. The guys decided to look for a veterinarian who would agree to go to such a strange place, to the utility room on the sanatorium's territory. And even more so, to an unusual dog resembling a wolf. They found a guy named Leisha, who worked as a veterinarian in the military and wasn't afraid of large animals. Wow, what an interesting dog you have, the veterinarian said from the doorway as soon as he saw Gina, this is a wolf dog. Really? John asked, we've already heard about such a breed, but the source wasn't trustworthy. I thought it was just talk. Is it a breed or what? Well, it's sort of a breed, but not officially recognized. From the name, it's clear they crossed a dog with a wolf. They experimented mostly with shepherds. The Dutch developed their wolf dog Sarlis in the 20s, that's what they called it. And in the 50s, the Czechoslovakian wolf dog appeared. These breeds are recognized by the international community. There are a few more that haven't received that honor. Just listen to these names, Kunming Dog from China, Italian Lupus, Japanese Shikoku, and our Perm Wolf Dog. I think this dog belongs to the last ones. It probably didn't come from Japan to us. During the conversation, he carefully examined the dog. They also crossed wolves with Malamutes, Lycus, Huskies, and even Poodles. Just for your information. Poor wolves, poor dogs, summed up the veterinarian. Thanks for the information, said Barbara, but where could such a dog come from here? Either there's a kennel nearby, or someone bought her and then threw her away. Couldn't handle it. Although, she could have run away herself. These animals are very different from ordinary dogs. They absolutely dislike confined spaces. Even in enclosures, it's hard for them. They need as much space as possible. So, if someone just let this dog run around the yard, it was clearly not enough for her. That's why she might have escaped. Strange, John said, but here in our utility room, she sits quietly, not trying to run anywhere. Well, because she understands that she doesn't have much choice. 
either die sick and hungry but free, or sit here quietly, get treated, and eat until she regains strength. Wolf dogs are very smart. They are orders of magnitude more intelligent than regular dogs, say breed experts. And these animals are, in a good sense, calculating. They assess the situation, analyze it, and make decisions independently, without a person's guidance. So right now, your pet perfectly understands that there's no need to do anything foolish and run away. She's very obedient, Barbara noted, she walks and responds to our slightest movement. If we call her a bit, she limps towards us. That means she respects and understands. Wolf dogs inherited manageability from dogs. They can be stubborn, of course, but they listen to a person if they respect him. You need to earn their trust, but it's worth it. It will be your best defender and guardian of the house. Very brave and with a high level of intelligence. They can assess danger, won't lie for no reason, and will rush to help their owners without a command. Although attackers must be very foolish people if they try anything with a wolf dog around. I'd run away just from the sight of one, not knowing the breed. Your dog is clearly of very good blood. I think there must be a kennel nearby. There should be a breeding place. Wolf dogs are not popular among ordinary people. Not many know about them. They are mainly sold abroad, and not loudly. I don't think there are such connoisseurs in the Moscow region. We were told that there is a military unit nearby where they keep such dogs, John said. There's a military canine center not far away, in Nyazivo. Very well known. It was created back in the early 20th century, they moved a lot, and they settled here in the 60s. Military and geneticists worked there, preparing dogs and people for military purposes. And not just for guarding and tracking. They train dogs for sabotage, communication specialists, medics, and people to evacuate on sleds. They also created new breeds. With that, the veterinarian finished the examination and manipulations with the paw. During this time, he professionally cleaned and treated the wounds, praised Barbara for using disinfectants and healing ointments, prescribed antibiotics for three days, and asked them to call him after that. According to his prognosis, the dog should be much better. The guys remembered that the catchers mentioned hitting Gina on the head, but the veterinarian didn't find any injuries or signs of a concussion. He also checked the old Dina. He found a tumor on her mammary gland. He advised them to observe it for a month, and if it increased, bring the dog to him for surgery. Will she handle the anesthesia? John asked, she's not young, but very old. I think she's at least 10, Robert estimated, don't worry about the operation. I'll do it under local anesthesia if she doesn't bite. At least she hasn't tried so far. A week later, Gina was unrecognizable. She was walking on all fours. She still looked exhausted, but confidence was already visible in her gaze, like that of an experienced wolf. The dog moved a lot during short walks. But she didn't try to escape. She willingly returned to her little corner at the first call. Dina was her tail, a faithful companion. She stayed behind, sniffing everything only after Gina. She approached young people only after Gina, as if emphasizing her second place and that she didn't claim anything more. The guys bought them collars in tender pink salmon tones. They also stocked up on leashes because it was clear that they needed to take the dogs away from here soon, but it wasn't clear where. No one noticed the animals yet, although John suspected that the administrator, a former military man, was just pretending not to notice but understood that everything was under control and there was no need to intervene. The plan for the guys was to wait out the New Year holidays and then organize a mass move. About a week after Christmas, John's 28 days in the sanatorium were coming to an end, and they had to think about where to put the dogs and where to live themselves. Barbara was renting an apartment. It was a dirty one-room apartment on the outskirts of Moscow. But the owners said they didn't welcome even cats in their apartment buildings, let alone two unidentified dogs from the street. Before leaving, the guys decided to try to find out where the dog of such a rare breed came from. What if someone is looking for her? It's easier to take the small old lady with them, but finding housing for the wolf dog will likely be challenging. The young people didn't know the address of the cottage where they caught the dog in a trap. 
but they had an idea of the area. They tried to search on the internet. But it didn't lead to anything. There were no results for a wolf dog search. Barbara asked locals she encountered at the bus stop on her way home. They didn't know anything either. Help came from where it was least expected. One day, John called that very administrator, the former military man. Listen, buddy, I understand everything, but the animals need to be removed. I've been silent, but now the patients are starting to notice the giant dog. They're asking for measures to be taken. The management has been shouting at me to call the catchers, but I'm stalling for now. But you understand, they'll fire me if I resist. Believe me, we would be glad, but we have nowhere to take them. I'm practically homeless now. Nowhere to check out. And Barbara, well, you're an observant person. I think you've noticed that we're together. So, she's in a rented apartment. Animals are not welcome there. We are trying to find the former owners of the big dog, if they exist, but the breed is rare. Wolf dog owners don't advertise the presence of wolf dog hybrids in their homes. So it's difficult to find out where she came from. But we'll look for her, and we'll take the old lady anyway, don't worry. Wolf dog, you say? It seems I heard where they keep them here. Some kind of kennel. I'll check through my channels. And you be more careful there. Don't annoy people, walk in the dark, maybe. A few hours later, he discreetly called John from behind his desk, playing the role of the sanatorium receptionist. Listen, I found out. There's a partially militarized structure nearby, but officially, it has nothing to do with the Ministry of Defense. Although it's not far from a large military canine center. So, you know, these military guys with their secrets, Thomas chuckled, they breed such dogs for protection on request from very wealthy people. And also for movie shoots. You can't put a real wolf in a frame. If it exists at all thanks to the wild imagination of the screenwriter, Thomas laughed, okay, let me contact them. Now I'll ask directly if they lost a dog. And after the holidays, we'll figure out what to do next. Now I'm going on a big holiday break. Thank you, just as huge as a wolf dog, John laughed, we'll stay low here, don't worry, we won't flaunt past the holiday makers. And they might decide that a wolf came out of the forest and ruin everyone's festive mood. The men laughed and decided to leave it at that. Then the New Year's hustle and bustle engulfed everyone and everything around. For a whole week, medical procedures were almost halted. Only the minimum remained, and most of the staff went on vacation, taking most of the patients with them. Cars kept arriving, and not very healthy but very happy people were leaving for home, looking forward to the holiday. The vacated places were rented out for the duration of the holiday to groups and couples who wanted to celebrate the new year in the countryside, in the fresh air, in relative silence. John had nowhere to go. Barbara decided to spend the holiday with him and expressed a desire to be the duty nurse on New Year's Eve. Unexpectedly, Linda joined their little company. They didn't have any special plans for the holidays. They decided that John would come to the sanatorium on a three-day voucher to spend time together without wasting it on trips home and back. John was concerned about how Gina and Dina would react to the New Year fireworks, which were also arranged in the sanatorium, although not on such a scale as in the city. But there was no way out. They hoped the dogs wouldn't be too frightened. However, the guys decided that, just in case, it would be better not to leave the animals alone. After the official New Year's meeting, they planned to visit them. And so, the long-awaited chimes announced the beginning of the new year with their familiar, resonant toll. Laughter, clinking glasses, and dancing people filled the assembly hall. Music played, and couples, including Linda with her husband, whirled around. The elderly man and woman in a wheelchair, maintaining remarkable elegance in dance, looked very touching. Afterwards, they returned to the tables with food and drinks, which were set up along the walls of the hall. There, John and Barbara were waiting for them. Why aren't you guys dancing, asked Stephen, Linda's husband, as he sat down. Did you see how we've mastered it? We'll take dance classes from you. We're not ready for such moves yet, John laughed. Barbara, Linda turned to the girl, I see you're a serious person, not afraid of challenges. You treat John well. 
What are your plans? Don't take this question as impolite. I know from my own family how difficult it is to build a relationship with someone on wheels, taking into account their condition. Stephen and I have been adjusting for a good year now. Since you seem determined to fight for happiness, even if it seems difficult at first? I'm determined, Barbara calmly replied, I'll do everything within my power. You know, I like solving problems as they come. Right now, we'll deal with the dogs and then think about what's next. We need to find some kind of accommodation. Even temporary. Where we can be with such a crocodile. I love her though. Listen, how about coming to us, Linda suddenly said. Judging by Stephen's expression, he hadn't discussed this question with her. We live in a private house. We exchanged my Moscow apartment in the noisy, dusty center for a nice house near the forest. You can place the dogs in the kitchen and living room, I won't let them into the bedroom, forgive me. But in the summer, if you stay with us, they'll be fine outside. We have a large plot. No, but we might feel uncomfortable, John hesitated. What's uncomfortable about it? I understand you're surprised at why I suddenly became so generous. John, I suppose Barbara told you my story in full. I don't think she kept silent. I asked her not to, but in this case, I only welcome it because I believe that there shouldn't be any secrets between a couple. Otherwise, it's not a couple, just two cohabitants in the worst sense of the word. So, what I want to say is, my little daughter would be about Barbara's age. Fate didn't allow me to see her life. Be proud of her, wait for those famous grandchildren. And it feels like I've been robbed, not a particularly lucky one and already ruined. And I can't live like this only with my wonderful husband. I want a house full of youth, happiness, hope, and plans. I treat Barbara like a daughter. For a long time now. She's a pleasant girl, hardworking, kind, and believes in God. I may not understand that, but I respect her for the purity of her thoughts and intentions. If faith is sincere, there is no other way. So think about it, guys. I invite you from the bottom of my heart, and the dogs won't be a hindrance. On the contrary, I have enough caring for living souls, honestly. Barbara, don't cry, my dear. Barbara indeed became emotional to tears. John looked at her with tenderness. Thank you, Linda. From the bottom of my heart, said John, this is a very unexpected and generous offer. Probably, we will take advantage of it because we have no other way out. But still, for decency, let's discuss it at our family council and make a decision, John smiled sincerely. Of course, guys. Let's think carefully, Stephen laughed. I'm not against your company if anything. It just turned out unexpectedly, but my beloved wife has always been so sudden. Surprised, mother, even after all I've seen from you. He kissed Linda on the cheek with a smile. John and Barbara were planning to visit the dogs. Fireworks were promised at midnight, and they decided to come to the pets before that time to spend time with them during the fireworks. They brought some food for the animals from the festive table, a couple of pieces of different sausages, a slice of baked meat each, so as not to be too bold, taking from the common table, but also to please the animals with something tasty. For themselves, they took a half-empty bottle of champagne and sandwiches with fish, cheese, and a couple of tangerines. With all this festive baggage thrown into the stroller, they headed towards the utility room. Direct catering for dogs, Barbara laughed, blushing from the cold and the previous champagne, delivery of goodies to the booth. Well, yes, it turns out to be an unusual holiday, John agreed. Everything has changed a lot for me this year. I celebrated the last one in a warm apartment as a healthy man with a potential bride and plans for life. And now, I'm riding in a wheelchair at night to feed homeless dogs. And not with a bride, but a simple girl. In Barbara's voice, John heard a hint of resentment. What are you talking about? You're the best girl in the world, and it's not just empty, loud words. I really think so. And I love you very much. It's a pity that we met under such circumstances. I can't provide you with a full life. Come on, John, the girl interrupted him. Let's not dwell on the past during the holiday, think about what could have been, and regret what happened. 
I don't regret it. But I met you, John said. Well, that's good. Let's spend this night so that it's memorable. It's our first new year together. And not the last, John looked at the girl tenderly. I really hope so, she smiled. The dogs also felt the importance of the moment. Dina approached Barbara and leaned warmly against her legs, and Gina approached John, sat next to him, and put her snout on his knees. She looked at him with a very strange look in her amber eyes. It wasn't the usual, unconditional canine adoration. The eyes were slightly surprised and seemed to be examining John. Can this person be trusted, and, in general, how to trust? There was a feeling that the dog was experiencing some new, unexpected feelings. Interesting, said John. I read about wolf dogs on the internet. They say they don't have a special devotion to humans. They don't get attached to us, don't constantly strive to be with us, and aren't afraid of loneliness. They are quite willful, as they told us. They have a good memory. They quickly memorize various commands, terrain, environment, but can ignore human orders and do things their own way. So, they usually take them as puppies to constantly communicate, establish trusting relationships. Respect. If you work on all this, then these dogs behave obediently but don't submit to you, rather, out of friendly feelings, they do what you want, not out of simple dog devotion. Interesting creatures, in short. Very complex, but fascinating. Yeah, and I read that they consider their owner's family as a pack and want to be the leaders in it, Barbara added. And the most curious thing is that they not only don't like other animals but perceive them as equals. And it's strange how she gets along with Dina. And Dina isn't afraid of her. At this point, Dina, quickly getting used to her name after a decade of being nameless, raised her snout and looked at Barbara, then shifted her gaze to John. She understood they were talking about her. Completing the inspection of the entrusted humans and not waiting for orders, she sighed like an old woman and curled up in a ball at their feet, while the young people stayed in the utility room until almost 3 a.m. Conversations were interspersed with kisses, but Barbara didn't allow them to go further. Religion doesn't allow it before marriage? John asked, teasing a little. No, I just don't consider it possible for myself to be close in haste in a sanatorium room or, moreover, in a utility room with dogs, Barbara replied. I'm upset by the thought that memories of the first night can become like that. Understood, John replied. I agree. Let's wait for better conditions. And so their New Year's night for two continued. With sips of champagne, new stories, and bursts of laughter. The dogs reacted to the fireworks absolutely calmly and quietly slept, not disturbing the conversation. After the new year, the young people didn't see each other for several days. The sanatorium buzzed, crowded with healthy celebrators, and Barbara had weekends, so she went home to prepare for the move to Linda and Stephen. They had video calls with Linda several times a day. They discussed what needs to be bought for the new place, what Barbara would take with her. John started to pack up for a new place of residence. His rehabilitation course was almost over. Linda's was a bit earlier, but she decided to extend her vacation for a couple of days to wait for John and then go to back again altogether. The departure day turned out to be memorable. The car wasn't allowed onto the territory, and the cheerful company had to show up in front of everyone. John and Linda were in wheelchairs, Stephen and Barbara walked on either side. On leashes that Linda's husband bought and brought with him, two dogs marched. Stephen held the small, quietly trudging Dina, and Barbara led the huge wolf dog Gina, who elegantly stepped with her paws from the ears. Barbara was entrusted to lead Gina, as the dog already knew the girl. Given the breed's peculiarities, it was better not to entrust the wolf dog to Stephen, who was a stranger to her. The procession looked impressive. Patients strolling around the area, even the always busy and hurried doctors, stopped to get a better look at this scene. People, dogs, wheelchairs. Finally, the company reached the car. The dog was packed into the trunk. Linda and Gina were seated in the back, wheelchairs were attached to the roof, and Barbara sat next to the driver. And they finally started towards their shared home. However, as soon as they drove off, Linda asked Stephen to turn off the road toward the river. A surprise, she said. 
I want to show you an unusual monument. They arrived at the specified location and got out of the car. Almost on the riverbank, on a trampled dirt area surrounded by sidewalk curbs, stood a white concrete cube with a sculpture of a Rottweiler, slightly tilting its head as if studying those who came to it. The plaque read, Monument to Sultan. Beloved dog of Countess Panina. Well, we never got a chance to walk here with you, John, but I wanted to show you this place, Linda said. Not just to you, but to everyone. Perhaps it's good that we all gathered here together. Everything in this world happens not by chance, I believe. So, I read about the history of this monument. This dog, Sultan, lived around the late 19th to early 20th century, it's not precisely known. But according to legend, he was a Rottweiler. And his owner, Countess Panina, was a very interesting person, a very noble lady. Her name was Sophia. The Tsar himself attended her wedding, Alexander III. Despite her nobility, she was against autocracy and was even dubbed the Red Countess. She helped the poor a lot, opening schools, hospitals, free dining halls for them. After the February Revolution of 1917, she became a member of the Provisional Government and held a position at the level of Deputy Minister. From state disdain to enlightenment. Then the Bolsheviks arrested her, there were financial disputes, and believe it or not, they released her out of respect for her personality and merits. In the end, the Countess emigrated to the United States. So, what am I getting at? That who would have remembered such a rich biography, apparently a wonderful person, if she hadn't honored her pet with such honors? Imagine, a century and a half has passed, and we know about Sultan's existence and are interested in his owner. So, I consider this monument not to the dog but to the person, not even specifically to Sophia Panina, but to human love, care, and loyalty. And I wish all of us to be such people and remain so despite all the difficulties. Everyone was silent, pondering her words. Yes, Linda, I agree, John finally said. You said it well, and you did the right thing by bringing us here. I feel more confident now. As long as there are people like you, thoughtful, honest, trying to help selflessly, I won't be lost. I apologize for such straightforwardness, but I felt a kind of relief. With Stephen, we know each other less, but you wouldn't have chosen a bad person as a companion. As for Barbara, I'm kind of confident, but I'm so afraid of new relationships. The last ones ended, you know how. But I understand that if you've shared so much about your life with Barbara, things you wouldn't tell everyone, it means you trust her, and you wouldn't have done so with just anyone. So, regarding Barbara, I'm calm. Forgive me, sunshine, for such frankness, he looked at the girl with a gaze pleading for understanding. Interesting observation, Barbara smiled. But I understand what you mean. It's okay. We'll discuss it later. Yes, let's go, said Stephen. I may not be as philosophical as you, guys, but I'm alive and freezing. And, please, pity the dogs. They're already looking at us anxiously. Let's get to the house, and we'll talk there. After two hours, they arrived at Linda and Stephen's cozy home. The guys went to arrange themselves in their room on the first floor next to the living room, which also served as a dining room. The hosts went upstairs to their bedroom. The dogs roamed the floor with interest, sniffing around the closed kitchen door, from behind which came the smells of the lunch that Stephen had prepared in advance. They also discovered the pillows laid out for them in the corner of the living room next to the heater. Seemingly satisfied with everything, they settled into their new places. An hour later, having finished setting up the minimal amount of belongings, everyone gathered for lunch in the dining room. Well, comrades, Stephen began, I suggest this plan. Today, we rest. Yes, you've had a sort of rest at the sanatorium, but the procedures put a strain on the body, so after such a break, you need to relax, paradoxical as it may sound. I had a friend, a driver at my previous job. He returned from the sanatorium, sat down to celebrate with his sons, drank a decent amount of vodka, went to sleep, and never woke up. His heart stopped. Everyone at work was shocked. He was so happy about the vacation. Haven't been for a long time, decided to get treated. Well, he got treated. So, let's take it easy today. 
get used to the surroundings, take a stroll around the area. I've raised the fence higher, attached boards to keep the wolf dog in, he chuckled at his pun, so she won't jump over. I read that they can. And they dig tunnels like pros, very freedom-loving. Gina seems to be staying put for now, but she doesn't have the strength yet for big adventures. So, I took precautions. Well, let's just take it easy today, and tomorrow we'll go and look for your wolf dog part or wherever they breed them. Everyone agreed, and the day passed in peaceful activities. Barbara and Linda took care of cooking for the extended family, including the dogs. The men tidied up the area. Stephen didn't let John overexert himself, but also didn't make him feel helpless due to the wheelchair. Listen, with your electric drive, you'll clean the paths faster than I will, he said, handing John a shovel. Indeed, placing the tool conveniently in front of the wheelchair and moving at a minimum speed, John cleared all the necessary paths of snow in a matter of minutes. After that, they gathered branches. Stephen handed them to John, who broke and stored them in a bag, then took them to the shed near the bathhouse for kindling. They decided to postpone heating the sauna for now, mindful of the strain on the heart that could be fatal after the procedures. Stephen was genuinely frightened by that incident. Afterward, John and Barbara went for a long, almost one-and-a-half-hour walk with the dogs. They had read that wolf dogs needed a lot of physical activity. They are naturally very active and enduring. They can cover long distances without resting, which is good in service. But in peacetime, they need to channel this energy and enormous strength somewhere, so it's recommended to walk them as often and as long as possible. Especially, they recommend actively spending evenings with wolf dogs. By night, these animals have a peak of activity, just like wolves. So now the guys went on a hike beyond the private sector where Linda and Stephen lived. They suggested that not far away, there was a large meadow where they could let the dogs run. It was interesting to see how they passed by the neighboring houses. Dogs started barking from under the fences, simulating brave protection of their territories, but after a couple of times, they stopped. Some fell silent, some whined additionally, and they immediately stopped barking. Apparently, they sensed that it wasn't an entirely ordinary animal passing by, but one with which it's better not to enter into conflicts. The guys reached the end of the sector, covered a considerable distance through the meadow, thanks to the wheelchair equipped with good all-terrain wheels that didn't get stuck in the mud. They unhooked the leashes from the dogs' collars and stopped to watch their bustling, exploring new scents, and other canine joys during their walk John remembered his dog Vesta, which he had in his early youth when he finished school. She was a scrapper, you know, he laughed, just like those under the fences barking at us now, trying to intimidate us not to interfere. She loved to bark. Sees a dog and starts barking in a deep voice. Such a sociable breed as a Labrador, but she was standoffish. If someone came to meet her, she responded, communicated, didn't get into conflicts, very yielding. Like Ardina. Ardina, John emphasized. Yes, Ardina. Well, where would we find a place for her? It will only take time. I'm subscribed to various volunteer groups on Facebook. There's no rush to find a home for an old dog. So, she'll live out her days in warmth and plenty with us. She eats a little, doesn't demand much attention. If you don't mind, I'd like to keep her. Not at all. Since we saved her from the catchers, we're responsible for her fate now, John smiled. In the evening, they had dinner in a friendly company and went to bed early. This night, John and Barbara finally had the opportunity to be alone in normal conditions. In the morning, seeing the happy faces of the couple filled with tenderness, Linda understood everything but kept silent. During breakfast, she seized the moment and, unnoticed by the others, winked at John as if to say, I told you it would work out. An additional hour was spent walking the dogs, and finally, Stephen, John, and Barbara set out for the location whose coordinates Thomas, the sanatorium administrator, had sent them. They took Gina with them. Linda decided to stay home with Dina, and there was no need to bring her along. After about 40 minutes of travel, they encountered a solid, tall, concrete fence in the middle of the forest. No gates or even a small gate were visible. There was no barking from dogs either. John called Thomas. 
Sorry to bother you, but we've arrived at this place where wolf dogs are supposed to live. Oops, strange phrasing. Yes, I understand, said Thomas. You probably can't get inside. I didn't think, there must be security there. I'll give you a number for contact. In a couple of minutes, John was dialing a man. The man who answered was aware of their arrival. Leave your car, he said. And walk along the forest path to the right. There will be a checkpoint. John was a little surprised that there was a whole checkpoint in the forest. But when they reached the spot, there indeed was something like a checkpoint. Behind a small gate, which was remotely open for them, there was a narrow passage between concrete walls. And further, the way was blocked by a barrier. A man with a stern look approached the guests. Oh, I didn't know you were in a wheelchair, he said in surprise. But there's no other way to get in. I'm Andre. We talked on the phone. Let's go. And where's the dog? Did you leave her at home, he suddenly realized. No, she's in the car. We didn't know whether to take her right away. Then let's take a look at her. It might be our Nida. But most likely, she belongs to a not-so-popular breed. And recently, one girl like that ran away from us. You, he turned to John, better stay here so as not to strain yourself. And we'll quickly check here and there. It won't work, John smiled. Firstly, on my super wheelchair, I'll easily overtake all of you with a whistle. And secondly, and most importantly, the dog won't let you into the car. You're strangers to her. How can we be strangers if she's ours, part of the family? But, I wouldn't risk it. Wolf dogs don't welcome strangers on their territory, in this case, in the car. Have you been recognized as her owner? Yes, said John. Although in my current condition, she is much stronger than me, and she may have more maneuvering opportunities. But, probably, yes, she listens to me unquestioningly. But with Barbara, she sometimes pretends to be deaf. Understood, then let's all go together. Approaching the car, Andre saw Gina, attentively watching from the trunk, and confidently stated, Yes, exactly, this is our Nida, but you'd better open the trunk. Let her sniff me first. They released the dog. She approached Andre and wagged her tail. This can be considered a greeting, he said. Sibberbetty creatures are not very emotional. She recognized me. It shows that she's happy. Let's go, he said to the dog, and she calmly followed him. This is a familiar word for her, explained Andre. Someone gives the command to go or come to me. It's shorter, and we get her used to it. Walking back along the path, they returned to the checkpoint, now accompanied by the dog. Andre opened the barrier and led them onto the territory. He asked them to release Gina from the leash, and she joyfully rushed to sniff everything around. Then she ran towards the enclosures where her fellow wolf dogs roamed. There were about a dozen animals, each placed in a separate chain-link fenced area. Gina sniffed each one through the mesh, and she seemed very pleased with the interaction. It's interesting that all the dogs are quiet, not barking, Barbara remarked. Yes, wolf dogs don't bark. But they can howl. Not often, usually at the moon, like their wolf ancestors. And airplanes, they say, irritate them. Luckily, we don't have them flying around here. In general, these are quiet dogs. Sneak up and silently devour, Andre chuckled. Let's go, have some tea, and discuss what to do next. They let Gina roam around the territory, which she clearly remembered, while the people poured aromatic tea made from local herbs into cups, as Andre explained. For a snack, he brought incredibly fragrant strawberry jam and made sandwiches. Sorry for what God sent. The dining room is closed until lunch. Our meals here are scheduled. Military discipline is established since we are all former military. And without discipline, dealing with these dogs is impossible. Let me tell you what we do here and about our Nida. We named her in honor of her ancestor. The she-wolf from whom all Russian wolf dogs originated. She lived in the early 2000s. With hunters in a remote village. They picked up the animal when she was two weeks old and raised her until she was two years old. 
the she-wolf grew very friendly, seeking communication with humans. The man, for some reason, decided to either rehome her or sell her. Eventually, Professor Kasimov from the Internal Troops Institute of the Ministry of Internal Affairs bought the animal. He immediately recognized this unique creature. Usually, wolves are super cautious and panic-stricken. Nida wasn't like that. She trusted people. She behaved like an ordinary dog, fearing strangers to a reasonable extent. He decided to try mating her with a German shepherd, as they did before him and in other countries. But Nida turned out to be very picky and didn't let anyone near her for a year. But eventually, she couldn't resist a handsome dog named Baron. Two hybrid puppies, Goy and Dina, were born out of this great and pure love. Dina, exclaimed Barbara. That's interesting. We named our second adoptee the same. Well, it's a long story. I'll tell you later, please continue. The results of the crossbreeding pleased the professor very much, Andre continued with the tone of a storyteller. The scientist decided that the selection needed to be continued to reduce the percentage of wolf blood in such hybrids to 10%, but he didn't have time. When it reached 25%, the project began to be closed, which was very strange. These animals are better than any shepherd, which still remains the most common service breed. Because they are all-purpose, they guard, search, detain, and protect. Well, you're comparing, said Stephen. A shepherd can pick up a trail after six to eight hours. That's its limit. And a wolf dog can find a scent after three days. In a confined space, it detects a person in 20 seconds, compared to four to six minutes for a shepherd. They were tested for border security and performed brilliantly. Strong, not demanding in living conditions, and with wolf instincts. So they quickly catch everything on the fly, fight to the end without retreating. They were also used in medicine. Thanks to their unique sense of smell, they can distinguish the scent of a cancer patient's blood from that of a healthy person. Well, it's incredible. And most dog diseases don't scare them. They live up to 20 years. Why was the project closed then? asked Stephen. These qualities are indeed unique for service dogs. Even I understand that, although I'm not a dog expert but an auto mechanic. Who knows, shrugged Andre. As always, they decided not to allocate more money. The professor was shocked and still tries to get funding. He promotes wolf dogs as much as he can. He has five of them at home. Once he posted a video where this pack, along with his granddaughter, played. It sounds intimidating, doesn't it? In reality, there are the sweetest scenes, where these five clowns with cute faces silently and concentratedly shove each other aside to hug the little girl. Not everyone manages to get along with such dogs, so we only give them to professional dog handlers or people who have experience with serious breeds. And we set solid prices to weed out potential owners and leave only those who are confident about the necessity of such a purchase. Your Nida is one of the best representatives of wolf dogs. I can't even estimate her value in money. We have big plans for her. The puppies from her were supposed to be simply the best of the best. So, we are very grateful that you found her and brought her. Her loss would have been very significant for the kennel. How did she escape in the first place? And why would she? John asked, sharing how he rescued the dog from the catchers. The guys told me they picked her up near some fancy cottage. That she used to run there to the local dog. Ah, uh. now it makes sense. Somehow, we didn't think she might run there. Well, on the old woman, there's a loophole. I mean our ingenuity. We searched everywhere in the vicinity, but didn't think about that place. In that cottage, her childhood friend lives. And they didn't change his name, the new owners moved him there two months ago. Bought by a guy who understands the breed, and there's less of the wild animal in the dog now. He's more manageable, a mix of wolf dog with 25% wolf blood and a German shepherd. But now, we can't determine the exact percentage until the professor gets involved again, sighed Andre. But we're trying to continue his work as best we can. And we sell such hybrids with minimal wolf blood to private clients, but I'll repeat, we strictly check them. In Evram's case, everything was fine. 
they calmly handed him over. The new owner picked him up in his car, and that's how Nida managed to pick up the scent and find his new home. Yes, I've already told you about the wolf dog's sense of smell, but it's just some kind of miracle. It once again confirms the uniqueness of these animals and their loyalty, as you can see. Separated from her friend, she covered more than a hundred kilometers to find him. At this point, the heroine of the story approached the group with a very businesslike look. Gina sat down and looked at John very expressively. Then, she slowly shifted her gaze to the sausage sandwich, sat for about 15 seconds, and, not waiting for the result, performed the same trick with Andre. Everyone laughed. Poor thing got confused. Imagine that. We put the wolf dog in a dilemma, whom to listen to, whose commands to follow, and from whom to demand food, said Andre. By the way, about food. These animals have a unique relationship with it. They are highly pronounced foodies. You know, when dogs are trained, they first find out what the dog will work for. Yes, that's the verb they use, work. Some are ready to do everything for a favorite toy, while others work exclusively for food. So, wolf dogs are like that. Praising them for the right actions is not even necessary. When the dog performs a command, it gets a reward, a treat, or a ball. But they also expect praise. If the owner expresses satisfaction with the animal's actions, it means they are satisfied too. But a wolf dog expects not approval, but gain from you. The logic is pragmatic. If it does what it's asked for, what will it get for it? And food is a tangible material gain for them, so they are willing to perform a command for it. Yes, she likes to eat in general, said John. Remember, Barbara, the first time we fed her? She literally emptied the bowl in a few gulps. We thought she must have been starving, lying in a trap for three days in the cold. Eat anything quickly. But then we noticed that she could eat like a bottomless pit, no matter how much you give, she devours everything. And that's a purely wolf habit, explained Andre. Stocking up for the future. What if there is no more prey? So, she can wolf down five portions at once and not burst. But, of course, we limit their diet. It's harmful to eat so much in one sitting. Better often but in small quantities. By the way, about your expenses on food and other things. We want to reimburse you for what you spent and thank you for not letting one of the best specimens of the breed be killed. It's very important for its development. Sounds pompous, but it's true. Take it. And he handed John an envelope. The guy opened the seemingly thin package. Inside were only ten bills. But what bills they were. John hadn't even seen such in person before. Each had a denomination of five thousand. Oh no. This is too much, John said and passed the envelope to Barbara. She looked inside and also looked surprised. Yes, there's fifty thousand there, answering Stephen's unspoken question, Andre said. Because, believe me, this dog is worth much more. Well, contact us if you need any help. We will help as much as we can. Thank you, said John. The amount is, of course, very large, but I won't refuse. I see you sincerely want to express gratitude, and we can really use the money now. You see, in what condition I am. A homeless unemployed man. And the guy briefly told about the events of the past months. Andre expressed his condolences. After a short conversation about life and plans, the guys, along with Stephen, were getting ready to leave. Gina also stood up and headed after them, thinking it was time to say, Goodbye. Where are you going, Nida? Andre called his dog. Let's go to the usual place. The dog started to follow him but then stopped, turned around, looked at John, and hesitated. It was clear she couldn't decide which way to go. Well, I'll have to hold her back, Andre said, attaching Nida to a leash. John approached the dog to bid farewell. She placed her head on his knees, looking at him with concern. Well, girl. I don't know if we'll see each other again. Live happily, behave well, I'll remember you. You are a very good and the most unusual dog I've ever known. Goodbye. John bent down and kissed her on the large, gray, wolf-like forehead. 
stepping back, he turned around, and accompanied by Barbara and Stephen, headed towards the exit. As the gate closed behind them, John heard a howl, a desperate, loud cry filled with pain and fear. He realized it was Nida. Turning around for a last glance at her from a distance, he saw that she wasn't on the farewell grounds anymore, she had almost flown over the barrier, pushing off with powerful paws from the asphalt. In two leaps, the dog flew to John and literally collapsed on his knees with her snout and front paws. The weight of the incoming wolf dog made John shudder. After her unexpected gesture, tears welled up in his eyes. He didn't know what to do with this sudden happiness. He just sat there, petting the dog. It was as if she held him with her paws and had no intention of letting go. She looked at the people around with such gloom and stubbornness that even the experienced dog handler Andre felt a little uneasy. Well, comrades, we're in a trap, he said. Congratulations, John, you've been chosen by a wolf dog, the one not prone to attachment by nature. And this beauty, first, ran to another friend, and now categorically demands only this owner. So, the results of crossbreeding please me as a professional, of course. But what to do in the current situation, I have no idea. Neither persuasion nor force will help. I don't have any ideas either, John said. Or rather, I have thoughts, but they don't lead to a solution. I can take her to Linda and Stephen for now. We've agreed on that. But we won't abuse their hospitality for long. We'll get back on our feet and find our own place. Speaking of a getting back on our feet, that's a figure of speech. Although, in reality, a new pair of boots wouldn't hurt. I'm not against helping, Stephen chimed in. But I also think it's not a solution to keep shuttling her back and forth. Listen, what's your profession? He asked Andre. I'm an architect, the guy replied. Ah. Uh. Paperwork, but not quite the same, sighed Andre. Although, do you think you could handle accounting? It's not complicated. And there's someone to give you guidance. The thing is, we recently kicked out our accountant, he was embezzling and drinking. His brother runs a German shepherd kennel. So, he was forging documents, putting our stamp on them, claiming that the dogs had a wolf mix. Then they sold their animals as exclusive ones at a high price. We found out when transferring Evrem to the new owner. He told us how our accountant offered him an exclusive dog at an unusually low price. He doubted, checked, realized there were scammers profiting from us, and decided to inform us in person. So now, we need to find a reliable person as our new accountant. Do you think, with some training, you could handle it? I can give it a try, of course, said John. If there's someone to guide me, then I'm in. I'll be grateful for any job. But still, going home and taking the dog with me seems challenging. No, that's why I'm suggesting you can live right here with us. Most of our team doesn't go home during the work week. It's far, and it's inconvenient to get to us. It's easier to stay here. We, the dog handlers, live in the house closer to the dogs, and our accountant used to have a room in the administrative building. You know, where the canteen is. So, feel free to join us if you agree. Our former accountant, who retired six months ago, will help you settle in. We contacted him when our current scoundrel showed his true colors. He worked with us for five years, trustworthy and reliable. I'm sure he won't refuse to help, Andre explained. That's how they decided. Barbara and Dina stayed to live with Linda and Stephen. Barbara commuted by bus to work from there. John and Gina worked at the kennel. They decided to keep her new name since she responded to it more willingly than to Nida. On weekends, Stephen picked them up, and they visited their friends. A month passed. John had already mastered the basics of accounting, and the dog dedicated her mornings and evenings to training, resting during the day. Additionally, once a week, she provided samples for various tests. At night, John led her to his room, located not far from the office at the other end of the corridor. Gina categorically refused to spend the night with her fellow canines in the enclosures, demonstrating extraordinary lung power on the first night. Andre personally escorted her to John's room, where she settled on the floor. The space was limited, and she had to sleep stretched along the bed, 
not very comfortably, but apparently, that's what she wanted. The nocturnal concerts ceased. Life went on quietly. However, an unexpected event occurred on a frosty February night. John and Gina had an evening ritual of tea with rusks. More accurately, John drank the beverage, and Gina devoured almost the entire package of treats. But she didn't do it just for her charming eyes. John gave her simple commands that didn't require much space to execute, like sit or stay. That's what they were doing when Gina suddenly got distracted. She perked up her ears, approached the door, placed her paw on it, and scratched it, signaling an urgent release. John followed her command, although he didn't understand what the dog had forgotten in the dark corridor. As soon as the door opened, Gina slipped out like a lizard and darted toward the office. It was unusual for the door to be open since John always locked it after work, considering the important documents stored inside. He approached and saw a beam of light coming from below. He entered the room and was astonished. Some unknown man, reeking of alcohol, had barricaded himself behind his desk like a shield, keeping a distance from the dog. A flashlight, which was evidently brought by him, lay on the floor. In the middle of the room, shielding the entrance and John, stood Gina, emitting a very quiet, guttural growl that made you want to freeze and not provoke the animal. Who are you? John politely inquired. The response was a string of profanity. Why is this mutt here, the stranger, with a stumbling tongue, finally managed to articulate decent words? All dogs should be in the enclosures. What a mess. He swayed, pushed the table to the floor to use it as a barrier, and then climbed on it to avoid falling. Gina observed his every move attentively. And then John noticed scattered pedigree forms on the desk, the kennel stamp, freshly used, and a bunch of keys, one of which belonged to the office. It was easy for him to recognize it, as the lock was old, and the key was very long with a triangular head. By this combination of items, John figured out that this was the previous accountant, a colleague, so to speak. Why do you need these forms? Selling your dogs with fake documents? I know your story, John said. It was worth your time to forge documents. You could have just stolen the stamp right away. I thought you were a legless invalid, turns out you're brainless, apparently, the man said rudely, with a mocking tone. To hell with the stamp. They'll make a new one, change the design. They'll announce everywhere that it's invalid. It's better and easier to take the papers. They don't notice their disappearance. And me, I've been exploiting human stupidity for a while. I walk in by memory. There are places here where you can come unnoticed. Those idiots think they have security with fences. Just didn't expect a dog to be wandering around this time. Get rid of her, and I'll leave. And make sure you don't tell anyone you saw me here. John was bewildered by such audacity. I'm going to call the police, he said. Unfortunately, his phone was in his room. He hadn't thought of taking it with him when he rushed out after the dog. You're going? You, cripple, and you're going? You'll crawl for me right here, the man sneered. With these words, the man raised the hand he used to support himself on the table, rushed to the side, and quickly pulled something from behind the cabinet. John saw the gleam of a blade. It was a hunting knife. The drunk man, in a frenzy, circled the table and, swinging it, lunged at John. He helplessly watched death approaching and realized there was no way to escape. And then, like a coiled spring released from under his feet, Gina shot up. Two weeks later, John was discharged from the hospital. He had been admitted to recover from severe emotional trauma. Andre and Barbara welcomed him by car. The girl had a mysterious smile. Dear, you're positively glowing. What happened? John asked, slightly surprised. A surprise, Barbara chuckled. You'll see and find out soon. Let's go. Andre, unusually silent, probably also maintaining the intrigue, started the car, and they headed towards the kennel. Well, are you in a condition to finally tell us what happened? Andre broke the silence. The police didn't tell us. Of course, you were talking during the interrogation. Sorry, please understand, I know it's hard for you to remember such things, 
but as a professional, I'm curious why Gina acted that way. And sorry for addressing you informally, got carried away worrying about you. You've become close to me. Yeah, no problem. Address me however you like. And yes, we can talk about what happened, John uttered. After gathering his thoughts for a moment, he began to recount. You know the ending, he said and described the events leading up to the moment when Gina went to defend her owner. He rushed toward me. Gina tried to intercept him according to all the rules, grabbing his arm. Not in vain they work on defense with her during training. She did everything by the book. You stop the bandit and fix his limb, without biting, without knocking him down, just hold. She did it all textbook. But he stabbed her in the side with a knife, and that's when Gina leaped at his neck. Well, you saw the result, John barely finished. And after that, I don't remember well. I remember people running in, the police arriving. Someone was taking me out of the room. And Gina, you took her, right, Andre? I remember she was sitting, not lying down. The wound wasn't too deep, apparently. How is she? I know she recovered, but is she back in action? You can ask her yourself now, Andre smirked, approaching the kennel but from an unfamiliar side. John didn't even have time to ask anything. Barbara and Andre quickly got out of the car, helped him into a wheelchair, and asked him to follow them. They arrived at a log cabin. Welcome home, Barbara laughed. John saw the ramp and realized that it wasn't there by chance. He wheeled into the house, finding a very cozy interior. The place had a sense of order, with a woman's touch evident in the vases and blankets. It felt like a lived-in home, though the items were clearly brand new. All right, mysterious people, explain yourselves, John demanded, jokingly. Well, listen, Andre replied in a similar tone, for the courage you showed in apprehending a dangerous criminal, well, okay, a drunk and a thief, John, you are rewarded with a personal residence. Seriously, John, we show this place to everyone. It's like our secret sanatorium. Those of us who wanted built houses here, away from the kennels and training areas. Now your little cabin is part of our mini village. It belonged to a former colleague who moved to Poland for good and sold it to us at a reasonable price. We kept it in reserve, and now we decided to gift it to both of you. Forever. Even if you don't work in the kennel. Although, we offered Barbara a job too, so she wouldn't have to keep traveling to the sanatorium. A person with medical knowledge is always useful here. We've been thinking of hiring a paramedic to treat all our minor injuries and wounds. And here we have a wonderful nurse at our disposal. In short, live, love, reproduce. He hesitated delicately. Oh, I've slipped into our dog jargon. Well, you guys understand, right? I've arranged everything here according to my taste, sorry, to have everything ready for your return, Barbara chimed in. I took it from the money we got for Gina. We thought of setting up another enclosure for her nearby, but she already claimed a spot here on the covered veranda. You won't be able to displace her now. So, we'll live with the wolf, but not how like wolves, I hope, she smiled. And Dina decided to stay with Linda and Stephen. They've become very attached to each other. Every evening, the whole gang heads to the sunset together, like retirees. She doesn't need surgery yet. The tumor isn't growing. Except for the fact that the old lady is growing in size herself. I'm afraid they'll overfeed her completely. But she's happy to gobble up everything they give her, Barbara laughed. The surprise worked, John grinned. Well, let's say our goodbyes then. Barbara, marry me. What? Didn't expect that? Well, I hoped for it in the future, of course, Barbara said, but a surprise is also good, I agree. Agree to what? Or to what? To everything, she laughed in response. And they even managed to kiss before the heavy and clearly hasty footsteps interrupted them. The group turned toward the noise, and indeed, Gina was flying toward them on all fours. With the grace of an elephant, she managed to break just in time to avoid crashing into John's wheelchair. Then, with all her might, she plopped her head onto his lap and began rubbing against him with her right side. 
After a long run, clouds of steam were billowing from her mouth, her tongue was hanging out, and even drool dripped directly onto John's pants. But he didn't notice. He was expressing his feelings too. He scratched the dog behind her ear, caressed her narrow snout, hugged her powerful neck, touched the bandage, covering the wound on her side. These two were absolutely happy. Gina, in full swing, acted almost like a puppy, almost climbing onto his lap. She spun around, rubbed, and her amber eyes shone with obvious joy, along with a slightly less noticeable tenderness reserved only for her people, those who could see a dear little girl in the stern wolfhound. The climax was when the dog wholeheartedly licked John's face with a snort after a long run. Even she seemed surprised by such an outburst of emotions. She sat down, looked at John in bewilderment, then at the floor, as if concentrating, stood up, and with a business-like air headed toward the exit. At the doorway, she slowed down, looked back, and gave a charming smile with her huge mouth and white fangs. She wagged her large gray tail. It felt like if she could, she would wink at that moment and teasingly say. And you said wolfhounds don't get attached to people, right? 